All righty. Yeah. Should we do this thing? Yeah. I think we're recording. <laughs> I should, know, just recording I should know what I'm doing. Well, how long hour. is this thing? 45 minutes, you say? 45 hours. <laughs> And then there's no recording, you have to come back. Exactly. I didn't hit record, Listen, that has happened. <laughs> that has happened. Yeah, not and with me. Not with you. <laughs> yeah. I didn't hit record. Okay, we're going to have to edit this up because people think we're unprofessional, Raymond. No, no, no. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hello and welcome to the CS2 Plus C show. It is a pleasure to have you along with us. Thank you to everyone that has liked and subscribed. We really appreciate it. It goes a long way to helping us out grow this CS Duplicy show and take it to the next level. Big shout out also, of course, to our partners at Betway. Check out betway.co.za for more information. We've got the Betway SA20 on the go. Catch 2 million rand has been fantastic. We've had five catches there. So check out betway.co.za for more information. Now, it's my pleasure to welcome a man that has refereed over 760 professional football games, Daniel Bennett. Um, where do we even begin? That's incredible. I mean, congratulations on a stellar career. I know you've retired a while ago, but congratulations, man. You must be very proud of what you've achieved over your career. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, uh, it doesn't come with luck either. It's, it's hard work. It's all the training that goes in, into it and, uh, you know, keeping your reputation intact, you know, being professional because um, they don't give out these games as potluck. You have to earn those those appointments and... Very, very proud of what I've achieved at uh, all levels through the PSL, through CAF, five AFCONs, obviously World Cup 2014. So, yeah, very, very proud of it. And uh, my kids sometimes don't believe I was actually at a World Cup. <laughs> Do you have to prove it to them? Like, well, listen, guys, I was here. <laughs> well, I showed them my kit with a, a logo of Brazil on and they're like, Dad, you weren't there. Yeah, you didn't actually go <laughs> You there. didn't go there. You just bought the T-shirt. And <laughs> uh, we will get to that because it's, it's a bittersweet moment mm. for you. Um, yeah, for sure. That 2014 yeah. FIFA World Cup, but I often say to people, and I mean, I'm a huge football fan. Um, if if I can, I watch as much uh, football on the weekends as possible. But I think it's the most thankless job in the world. I know it's also one of the hardest jobs in the world, um, but thankless definitely and loneliest. Yeah, be out there on your own with the eyes of the world on you. 22 players that sometimes are behaving like hooligans. You've got to control them. You got millions of people watching. You, when you make a mistake, you're at fault. When players make a mistake, nobody blames them. Like the other day, I think Mali missed a penalty against Cote d'Ivoire. Nobody blamed the player. They lost the game. Yeah. Um, and also training. You're training on your own. Whereas a football team, they've got their whole squad there. They're bantering. They're having a good time. It's not fun training on your own. You know, and and it's hard work. The training. Because the fitness test is very, very tough for referees. And if you don't pass, you don't get games. And you're out for six weeks at least to redo another test. Rightly so, so though. Yeah. If you're not fit, then you don't deserve yeah. to be on the field. And uh, so the training is also very lonely. I mean, I spent, I never had a training partner my whole career. Um, so it's always down at a, a local school down the road from where I live. And, you know, it's, it's a hard slog, an hour and a half, two hours training. And you're there by yourself. And to try and motivate yourself sometimes is... A little bit tough when you're going through hard times, you know, when you're not performing very well. You've got to pick yourself up and, and just keep on going. Um, that's fascinating, the point you make. Lonely training. What does that training look like? Is it road work? Is it sprints? Because you've got to be endurance fit, but you've also got to be where the action is yeah. and read the game at the same time. So the fitter you are, I suppose, the less you're huffing and puffing, you're able to make better decisions. I was lucky I had a very good attribute to my refereeing because I was not the fittest, I'm going to be honest with you. <laughs> I did the training, yeah. but as you get on in years, obviously that training becomes more tough, and that's why I gave up. I just couldn't find the motivation, but I, my attribute was reading the game very well. Mm. So before the ball's even kicked, I know where it's going because you can read the player's body language, and that's a very important trait for a referee to try and instill in their, in their football by reading the game and then anticipating the next phase of play. That's what I was really good at. So yeah. I don't have to be that fit, but the training is not road work, that's for sure. Yeah, um, It's intense. It's it's very technically um, arranged, and there's programs that go through the various confederations, and it, the training's different per day as well. So if you've done a match, the next day you're not doing high intensity, you're doing recovery. And then you're only doing high intensity like two days after the match or two days before. So it's very, very methodically planned mm. and there's a routine and you know there's different there's a thing called the dynamic yo-yo test which is a high intensity test but 
FIFA d- divides this test that you actually run off at angles across the field of play. Um, which Not is a like fi- a straight line no, beep test. No, nothing's yeah. in a straight line beep test anymore. I mean, that, that's for just pure uh, high, high intensity or an endurance. But now there's an actual the dynamic yo-yo. There's cones all over the field, and you've got to get to one cone by the time the beep goes, and then the next cone by the time the next beep goes. And that is actually regarded as one of the official fitness tests. And it's quite intense because you're covering the whole field. You're not just running from penalty area to penalty area. You're covering touchline to touchline as well. So it's very intense, and it's very methodically planned according to your match days. So, I mean, and this is meant with all due respect, when we see as spectators, you see referees warming up, it's almost like a little bit of a laugh, you know. But now that you're telling me how fit you have to be and how crucial that act, aspect of the game is, that warm-up with your assistants up and down is actually a vital part of being ready for the kickoff. Yeah, well, we're like players. We need to warm up as well to prevent injuries. Yeah. So obviously every referee, the referee takes the lead in the warm-up. Everybody has their different style of warm-up. But the guys generally tend to all do the same thing now. So they run up and down the half a line and they use a the center circle to do different movements and yeah. different stretching movements. So everything before the game is obviously dynamic movement because you want those muscles really flexible. Then after the game, it's more static. So yeah. um, it's all varied. And, you know, the guys are pretty consistent with warm-up. But it is. It's a vital part of the game. The players need to warm-up. So do we. I mean... You'll see refs even before amateur games warming up because that prevents the injuries and you need to be ready for the game, flexible for the game and, and ready to go, you know. In your 760 odd pro games that you refed, was there ever a game where you were like, oh, this hamstring or this quad or calf or, you know what I mean? In a game where you were like, I might be in trouble here. I was very fortunate with injuries, except for the most vital in 2014. <laughs> Sorry. So I, I, mean looked, uh, I looked after my body. I made sure that... Um, like I just said, before the, before games, before training, mm. dynamic warm-up, afterwards, always stretching. The odd ice bath, I don't like cold water. <laughs> and, 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 it, and it burns, the ice bath, bath burn. But uh, I was very lucky with injuries. I think I hardly had any injuries. I can't even think of one in the PSL where I had to come off a game. Um, so it's about looking after the body yeah. as well, CS. Um, you it shows really your professionalism, to, though, how you well, approached it. You if know? you want games and you want to get to the top level, you've got to perform. And obviously the, the committees at various confederations or, or, or boards within they look at your uh, injury history you know so um, like I said I, I looked after my body very well um, I ate correctly and I, I just you know did the right training when I was supposed to do that type of training I yeah. didn't overdo it because there's no point overdoing it um, so yeah I was just very fortunate with that and I mean I don't know if many people realize this but you had a full-time job pretty much you know it yeah. was like balancing Professional refereeing, and you involved at school teaching. Yeah, I mean that's hectic. Yeah, well, I eventually got to a point where I stopped teaching PE because it was just too much, and the school <laughs> okay. were actually suffering as well. Where, and you know, with with football refereeing comes all the traveling as yeah. well. So I was missing lessons because I was in, doing a game in Cape Town, for instance. So you fly back. I try to get the six o'clock flight the next day. I'm only back in Joburg. At eight, with traffic, I'm only back at school by nine. I've already missed uh, almost one lesson. But it's worse when you go to, like, maybe a tournament. I'm away for five weeks. So the school started suffering. And obviously with the school come parents who were moaning because the kids were missing or I was away. I'd find a substitute teacher. But it wasn't the same for the yeah. for, for the for the parents having a substitute. They wanted me there. Not, not sounding vain or arrogant, but they wanted me there. So, yeah, it, it was tough. So then I downgraded to, like, head of sport sports coordinator so I still wanted to be involved with the school but obviously not at a level of teaching because it was just it was becoming too much and then obviously managing kids yeah that's that's the other side I mean getting them to all their events and to school and all their sports activities it's it was three full-time jobs to be honest and I mean being a dad yeah <laughs> so which is as you was put the hardest job in the world that is it's a tough one because <laughs> these kids of mine are so busy and I, every, every parent's kids do something after school yeah. an extramural or uh, a, a cultural event and to get them to all these events it's and to school and you know it's kids parties and uh, play dates and you know, times, about have, that. times have changed every since weekend we were kids. he's at a play, kids yeah. party no it's crazy so yeah. it's that's my full time job do you have now. cards at home please tell me you have a card system yellow red no, nah, my kids are well behaved, <laughs> <laughs> okay. even though they play football. <laughs> um, it, it's uh, I want to touch on on the 2014 World Cup FIFA World Cup because that was it was a, a bittersweet moment. But we'll get there. Um, in your teaching days, you had a pretty famous student. Um, 
she's a, a friend of mine and someone who's done incredibly well mm. in broadcasting. She's yeah. a TV star, actor, radio host. I mean, was Tando Tibete naughty at school? Well, she's a superstar now. I mean, not just a... I mean, <laughs> she's a superstar. I... I didn't even know she was that big until I heard her on, on a certain radio station. I thought, is that the same Tando I used to teach? But uh, <laughs> it's, I actually phoned into uh, that radio station the other, uh, when she first started. And, you can uh, mention the radio station. They were, Justin was comp- asking about uh, who knows Tando, and I phoned in. I said, I was a PE coach, and then he asked me on air, was, was she a fit kid? And <laughs> she did swimming. Yeah. Uh, we used to do bleep tests as, a, as an assessment. You mentioned bleep tests earlier, and she was okay. But uh, she, she was actually a, an angel in school. She was she was very very bright. Okay. Uh, didn't misbehave much. She had respect for all the teachers. No, she's a she's a real nice nice lady. She's 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 top class. Okay. She claimed to be a badass at school, but uh, I don't think it's maybe true. high school. <laughs> <laughs> Shout out to Tanda to Betty. Um, Daniel, looking at your career. When it started for you, I know obviously in your amateur career you had to build up games, but yeah. and there's obviously the the sort of I think refereeing and being in your blood, in your DNA, and mm-hmm. your history. Was there ever a moment where you thought you would never be a referee when you took over? Because I can imagine when you're starting off as a referee, there's abuse. You know, it's it's tough. How do you keep yourself motivated? Is it because you want to make it as a professional re- referee and be at a World Cup? Because it can be daunting, and I, and I suppose it's a conversation we can also have. That barrier to entry for a lot of referees is the abuse they get, not just in South Africa, but the UK, all over the world. It seems to be getting worse, even at the lower levels. Well, I tell young referees as the, the, how I got discovered. I was in the right place at the right time, yeah. and the reason why I say that is, is I always doesn't matter what game it is, always be professional. I was spotted at under. 17 tournament in Verenigen back in 1994 where our ex-head of refereeing who's now sadly passed away, a guy called Zach Masetli was in the stands and he saw me refereeing a game and I didn't even know he was there. So I always say every game is important. Mm. Don't take just because it's Robertson versus Sporting in the Southern League likely because you don't know. You might have Daniel Bennett watching that game. Johnny DeToy who's on the SAFA committee watching that game and they can recommend you Sean Olive who I used to also teach who was who then came to Mondial Primary he he got discovered by Carlos Henriques who was uh, a match commissioner so every game is important because you don't know who's there yeah um, and then yeah the abuse it's 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 one of the biggest problems in football yeah. at the moment I mean I, I don't know if you saw the Mali Cote d'Ivoire game after the game the referee was pushing he was pushed uh, the abuse online, social. I mean, I heard a story on the radio about TMOs in the Rugby World Cup. Wayne Barnes had to retire because of social bullying. So it's not just in football, it's in all sports. Yeah. And it, it, it is a serious problem. It's obviously more serious when it's on the field and it becomes more physical because then your life's at risk. Whereas yeah. if it's on a Instagram post or a, a Facebook feed or a reel or whatever it is, that's, that's totally... It's not lacquer, but it's also... It's safer, but when you have the physical side of it, I mean, you ref at the the amateur leagues. There's no there's no PSL protection there. There's no security to help you. You're on your own, and you, if there is that situation, you're just hoping that somebody from the other team or a spectator or somebody there can sort of have your back. I'm gonna, I'm going to put you on the spot now because how do you convince a young aspiring referee to pursue being a referee? Because at the moment, as you've seen with your kids and other kids. They all want to be the Cristiano Ronaldo's, Lionel Messi's of this world, you know. Um, but there is a place for referees. The game will not be the same without referees. You have to have referees. Yeah. But it appears to be a very difficult sell. It is difficult. Um, what we try and encourage at Safa is, we, like my son plays for Alberton Football Club, what they do is they take all the under-15s and 17 players and they tell them, listen, guys, you may not make it as a player. But if you want to stay in football, the other avenue is, okay, you've got other avenue, you can be a football administrator. But if you want to be actively on the field, then the other alternative is a match official, whether it be an assistant referee yeah. or a referee. And I think most clubs are doing that. And when the leagues happen, they actually use those under 15s and 17s in the little leagues, like the under 8s, 9s, 10s, 11s, 12s, to ref those games. So they've got their qualification with their exam and their certificate for level seven 
or level one, two, three, four, whatever the case may be. And then they use the leagues for them to get experience on the field of play. So I think a lot of clubs are doing that. And you'll, oh, find, great to hear. you'll find some of these, I know one <coughs> of the refs at Alberton, he's already playing for the SAFA Development League. So he's, he's now got an opportunity that if he makes it all the way as a player, obviously he's going to let refereeing go. But if he doesn't make it, he's got enough experience. And if he wants to carry on with football, um, then he's got the other avenue of refereeing. The same thing happened to me when I broke my leg in, in, in high school. And my, my dad then said, why don't you become a ref? Because you're not going to be the same player. And it just went from there. So it's all, also up to the determination of, of, the, of the individual as well. If you're weak and you're not willing... I always say to young referees, if you're not used to criticism or abuse, although we don't come down abuse, criticism is part of the game. Uh, and abuse, it might happen. It all depends on the standard of your refereeing also as well. Yeah. You know, if you're messing the game up, you know, things are going to happen, which is not is not right. But that's the territory that comes with football. Yeah. Um, it brings me to my next question and something that you and I have spoken about quite a bit before. The VAR seems to be a hit and miss for... for, for I don't think there's one team in the Premier League, English Premier League, yeah. that hasn't suffered yeah. at the hands of VAR. But in principle, in your opinion, is it the way to go? Well, you look at the Afghan. They've got every single intervention correct. Yeah. The VARs have non known when to intervene, when the referees made a clear and obvious error or missed a serious incident. So they've known when to intervene and when not to intervene. And when the interventions have happened, whether it's an OFR or a VAR only review, it's been spot on. Yeah. I don't think there's been one bad VAR review. Whereas in the right. EPL, we're seeing one bad review a match. Why not is that over happening? The weekend. Though? Yeah, exactly. I have no idea. Um, cause the VAR protocols in the handbook are, are clear. Yeah. I don't know how in the EPL they just cannot get it right. Is it the pressure they're under maybe? You know, because it is the, it's the biggest league in the world. Uh, and as you say, AFCON's been spot on. It's Africa's crown jewel in, a, in, in football and they've been on point and, and long may it continue. But yet the most hyped league in the world and some of the best right. refs in the world exactly they're regarded as best refs in the world probably compared to La Liga and uh, and the French League yeah. but uh, I mean they've got two referees that went to the World Cup Michael Oliver and Anthony Taylor so they must be regarded as the best so I don't know if it's the VR training um, I don't know what goes on but in it's the EPL. same handbook right it's the same handbook same implementations of when to get involved when to intervene when not to intervene um so I just I think it's down to the leadership and the yeah. training that they get. Yeah, because I mean the handball one for me is the most bizarre, and the soft penalties that are being given. I mean footballers act like I, I quite like the the yellow cards being thrown around for dissent. I, I think that's a step in the right direction. But when it comes to guys trying to make things, and it's across the board, um, make it look worse than it is, I find that appalling. To be honest, just get on the game. Yeah, I find that players running through midfield, they'll take the strongest challenge or the strongest shoulder charge. But as soon as they're in the penalty area, one small touch and they're on the floor. Yeah, it is. And I would like to see more yellow cards for simulation. Yeah, diving. Um, if the referee, so the laws of the game are very clear. If you're trying to deceive the referee, it should be a yellow card. So if a player's obviously going down too easily, he's trying to deceive you, should be a yellow automatically. But I think we're too weak as referees on simulation. I'm glad there's more cards for dissent. And the IFAB are actually putting out a couple of trials now. And what the IFAB's uh, sort of attitude or mentality now is these four trials that they're going to try now is putting the behavior back in the player's hands. Let's give them back their own responsibility because referees are not quite cracking it right now. It's getting out of control. I've got mates who don't even watch football anymore. Really? It's, they say it's a mess because of player behavior. So now hopefully these trials from the RFAB will hopefully put that onus back on particularly captains yeah. and coaches. And uh, the technical director of RFAB actually went to a World Clubs forum about a month ago. And all, I think it was the top 20 uh, teams in Europe, they board, owners, managers, coaches, all agreed that players' behavior is out of control. Yeah. And they want to now try these four experiments, which is going to put the players' behavior back in their own and their own responsibility. And also, I mean, it has a knock-on effect. I mean, because kids are seeing these guys do it, we're seeing it at 
the junior levels. I mean, it's actually quite shocking to see, you know, how that filters down. So I'm hoping that this takes takes we, off. We and really I mean, the, the experiments could we're supposed to start. Any league in the world can do it. They just have to apply for permission from IFA. And uh, from what I've heard, a lot of a lot of federations are wanting to take this. These you don't have to take all four. You can take one. You can take three. You can take all four. So you can do whichever ones you want, whichever you think is beneficial for your league. So we hope that kicks off because, I mean, like I said to you, my boy plays under nine, Alberton. He watches some games and he's like, but that's not even a foul. But the refs are giving penalties and that's a nine-year-old boy talking. Yeah, exactly. Um, it's interesting. We're also seeing with the, with the Premier League, and I know uh, we're very biased towards the Premier League, but it's... We get sport because it's on super sport and we get to see all the games each weekend and long may that continue too um because it's worth paying for <laughs> uh, <laughs> as a sports fan but um to be honest i look at the additional time the how does maybe just explain that to me because it seems like all of a sudden we're seeing 10 minutes mm. additional time that's at the end of a game or stoppage time at the end of a half and is that the right way to go? Because suddenly 90 minutes games are no longer 90 minutes. You're looking at maybe 110 almost. Yeah, I've, I've heard cases. a lot of complaints about this um, online. Players as well don't like it because some of these EPL players, they're playing three games a week. Eh? They're yeah. playing on each weekend and in the middle they've got a Champions League game. So now you're playing 110-minute games times three. I mean, I'm busy with um, some UEFA work at the moment, the last round of Champions League games, the last day of group. Group six, group that match day six, and I'm not even lying to you. The average time of of at the end of the first half was one two minutes. I think one of the games was max three. Really? So what's supposed to happen is obviously you add the time for stoppages. You don't add times for throw-ins as part of the game. Uh, players receiving treatment, uh, goals, yellow cards, red cards, whatever the case is, something that's not part of the ball naturally going out. That's what's supposed to happen. So in the EPL, I think the referees are maybe giving it a directive to add more time because there is a study that the ball's in play for only 23 minutes of a 45-minute half. That's a proper stat. Wow. 23 minutes of the 45, it's in play. So I think they're trying to increase the playing time. But for me, it should just be the additional time. You know, you put in players under pressure, referees under pressure because they're also out there. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it's just a directive from the EPL to play more time. Okay. Um, I, I've always looked at it um, that obviously as a neutral, the longer the game, the better, you know, for the viewership. But, mm. you know, we're seeing more and more players getting injured. Yeah. You know, the, we're seeing hamstrings. We're seeing players with ankles, groins out for a lot of time. So the workload clearly has had a knock-on effect here. Yeah, I mean, you... I was watching the Arsenal game the other day, and at Ramsdale just took a kick of the ball and he pulled his hamstring. He didn't go off, but he needed treatment just from a. This is in the seventh or eighth minute. I think it was against PSV in the Champions League. After seven minutes, his hamstring had not gone, but he certainly felt a strain just from kicking the ball. So it does have its toll on the body. I mean, not only are they doing three games a week, the teams that are in the Champions League, they're doing their training. You know, some guy, some of these training sessions should be could be high intensity to get the fitness up. So, well, if yeah. Mikel Arteta is anything to go by, I'm sure it's, it is. It's taking its toll on the players, yeah. and and at the end of the day, who were there to watch? Were there to watch the players? You know, yeah. whether the balls, in, whether it's ten minutes of additional time or three minutes, that's think player safety is crucial in football. No, no. It's the most important thing in football is player safety. Absolutely. Um, Arsenal at the moment, looking at the way they're playing. Statement win over Liverpool over the weekend. Yeah. I know that your loyalties are kind of divided. Yeah, I'm a mixed bag. Arsenal and Leeds, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, but looking at Arsenal at the moment, uh, good for the title. I know City and Liverpool will have a say in this. Um, but at the moment, playing some good football, they're actually very easy on the eye. Look, they're playing good football, but... Look, I'm... Uh, I wear the two hats. Only when Leeds are in the pre in Premier League, do I, I look. I follow them in the EFL when sure. ESPN's playing their games, and I'll watch. But when it's Arsenal versus Leeds, I'm a Leeds guy. So because Leeds are out, it's not Arsenal. But as a big fan of Arsenal, I, I just don't think they've got that edge, not yet. Lacking a striker, maybe an out Big time. Nine. I mean, Jesus wasn't playing. Yeah. On uh, on Sunday, so look, they still won the game, and Ketia is not getting much game time. And they're swapping the two. I think they just need a solid number nine. Um, Jesus, I like him as a player. I think he's a great player. But they're just not scoring enough goals. And they, they, they often leak a few as well. 
And then so that's a goalkeeping department that's also in, in, in trouble there as well. I think Arteta needs to decide who he wants to play. Who would you play? I'd play Ramsdale. Okay. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you saw the mistake uh, Raya made. I mean, Saliba's trying to shield the ball. You're two yards, just pounce on it. You're allowed to use your hands, just get hold of the ball. So sure. I think it's a mixed bag there, but I just don't think they've got their cutting edge. Liverpool, okay, missing Salah. Still smashed four against Chelsea. Um, so I think they've got the Man City one convincingly on Monday as well, yesterday. So I think it is a three-horse race, but I just think City might edge it again, to be honest. Eh? I know Liverpool fans aren't going to be happy <laughs> with me, but I mean, they just have that depth. Yeah. They've got so much depth. They um, didn't have, yeah, they've still got their financial fair play worries, though. Well, I hope they... What's that, 115 hope, charges? I hope that follows through, because, I mean, they dock Everton 10 points. How have Everton overspent when Man City haven't? So... Anyway. I think all clubs <laughs> in the EPL have overspent, Absol to be honest. What do, I mean... I suppose that it's not financial fair play anymore. What's it? Sustainability yeah. or something. But for me, it's um, it's hampered that sort of excitement around transfer windows. You mm. know, I think the days of us seeing the mega sign. I mean, you guys got Declan Rice for what a hundred or something or hundred and five, something like that. That that sort of future of that big hype transfer window I think it's going to suffer as a result of this but I suppose you're protecting the bottom line and the sustainability of the clubs I think they need to cap it to like maximum 80 bar for a player because it's, it's just becoming in, insane it's, it's obscene overpaying and they're, they're paying these guys 300,000 pounds a week I mean <laughs> for four years yeah that's crazy <laughs> it's insane the amount of money that's in football and a club like Chelsea is signing players with like six or seven year contracts so that yeah. it costs that only goes down on the books is like 10 million a year type thing. So they've been very clever, but I think they're also going to be found out at some point. But it is fascinating to watch. I think um, we, we're spoiled for choice with mm. the amount of football out oh, there. Yeah. And I think for me, seeing someone like Lyle Foster in the Premier yeah. League, yeah. we should have more local players playing in the top leagues of the world because it, it seems to me that they've got a good life here in the, in the PSL um, and you know that sort of going to play in a, in a winter's uh, frosty evening at wherever it might be at St. James's Park yeah, fair enough. <laughs> that's a great place by the way <laughs> I'll go there any day <laughs> um, but it but it's that sort of aspirational thing mm. you know I mean, would you like to see more of that? I'd or? love to see more uh, SO players in the, in the EPL. Because it does have a knock-on effect with Bafana. Well, if Bafana win the FCON, there'll be a, surely a few big clubs looking for some of our, our, our Bafana players. And we hope. One or two from Sundowns that already no, are for sure. attracting it. I mean, Percy's in, in Egypt. Yeah. Ali's been there for a couple of years now. You mentioned Lyle. And I just, you know, I'll go back to the old days, like early 90s when Lucas... Uh, Mark Fish, Eric Tinkler. I mean, we must have had six, seven in the in the in the in the EPL in well, the Premier League. All these guys. Bartlett's Premier League. Yeah. Sean Bartlett. Yeah. Another one. So yeah, it would be great to see more PSL players in the in the EPL. It's hard work though, and and they need to understand that it's really hard work. I mean, like you mentioned, the cold, for instance. It's yeah. Freezing that. And it's lonely. Of the year. Uh, you can say yeah. what you want. It's lonely. It is. You know, it's different culture. Yes, the language barrier sometimes might be an issue, but. Still, the most sought-after league in the world. Of course, it is because of the of the money. The first money, of all. yeah. And then, obviously, like you say, we get every single match. Us when Leeds were playing in the EPL last year, I'd like send my mum a score. My mum who lives in Leeds, and she says, "How are you watching the game?" <laughs> they don't even get it, and she lives in Leeds, yeah. so we are very spoiled for choice. Yeah, I often laugh. My brother is, lives in France, and he says Liga is just terrible. <laughs> he says it's worse than watching the PSL. <laughs> He's like, send me your DSTV login. I'm like, it doesn't work there. But, yeah. but um, we are spoiled for choice. But I think looking at where Bafana is and something you mentioned, Hugo Bruce got serious abuse when he started to bring in young players and uh, developing this culture of what's the next generation. But it's paying off. Oh, you can you can go back to the haters now, can't you? He's <laughs> exactly. done so well with them. I mean, Semi-finals. Who knows? Hasn't happened in 28 years. Yeah. And who knows what we can do from here. They've, I'm sure the camp is really motivated after Roman's performance uh, against uh, Cope Bird. So hopefully the motivation's up, the inspiration's up, and, you know, they, they've got each other's back, I'm sure. 
So let's see what they can do. Hopefully we can beat Nigeria tomorrow. And, you know, Hugo Bruce can now. There's nothing sweeter than proving your haters wrong. Absolutely. I promise you. And I'm sure you've had haters. Oh, yes. I mean, 2013 yeah. AFCON. Oh, yeah. Sorry, I'm, I'm bringing up a sole point here. But you were in, in hot water. Yeah, I was sent home from, from the tournament. What, what happened there? I mean, I want your side of the story. My side of the story is I made a big dog's breakfast of the actual <laughs> second half. So first half had gone really, really well. And uh, What game was that again? Just it so was Tunisia versus Togo. Okay. Uh, last group game of the of the uh, last match day of the group stages. So whoever won was going through to the round of 16. High stakes game. Massive. I mean, these affect elections, basically, I think you're saying. It did affect the elections of the Togo oh Federation. Oh, no pressure. They were having a punch-up in the, in, the, in the VIP lounge. So the second half went miserably, terribly bad. Is that just reading the game? Is it just, is it just, just a bad day at the office? I just, to be honest, I got arrogant. First okay. half had gone so well on a top game. Yeah. The players came out firing, and I just wasn't ready for it. Okay. I... Uh, I dropped my guard, uh, I, I relaxed too much, and I just absolutely messed up the second half. It was, it was a debauchery. So then after that, um, Adabayo wanted to have a fist fight with me in the tunnel or in the car park. Luckily, the SAPS were there to stop him because he, he was a problem the whole second half. Yeah. I, I was actually I, I actually sympathized with him because I was having such a bad game that I, 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 I said – even though he's in my face all the time, I'm not going to send this guy off because it's going to cause more problems. So if I'd sent him off, it would have been worse. Yeah. Because he was just being a, a pain the whole second off. And then after the game, he he had he tried to go for me, but like the police were there. So you, you do have those headaches. People don't see that because no. that's, that's behind closed doors because that's in the car park. That's it. These are the types of things that happen. Um, have it, you had any other incidents like that in the past? Yeah, I was doing um, Bloom Celtic versus Pirates. But this was on the field, eh? And uh, I sent off Onyekani Akonko for Pirates. It was that pre-season 9 o'clock kick of the charity spectacular. Okay, yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So Pirates... This is a friendly. This is a friendly pre-season <laughs> match. So I sent off Akonko for a really shocking challenge. And if it wasn't for Stanton Fredericks, who's a good mate of mine now, I think he would have assaulted me on the field. He ran. So when he saw the red card, it was like a red rag to a bull, literally. And he just ran for me. So I said, so I took a few steps back. And then I said, no, wait, you've got to stand your ground. Don't let this guy rule you. So I stood my ground. And as he got to me, Stanton literally almost rugby tackled him and just pulled him back because he was going he was going full tilt for me. Yeah. So, and that was on the field. <laughs> Most of the other situations happen at low-level football, yeah. you know, because there's no protection there. Yeah. You're basically a sitting duck. Jeez. That's what I say. Thankless, lonely yeah. job. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, Daniel, getting back to that, that 2013 AFCON and, and looking at other AFCONs, you did five. Yeah. You had some of the biggest names in world football. I mean, I think you mentioned like Didier Drogba. Yeah. You had like these guys lining up as the captains of their respective nations at this African football crown jewel. That adds pressure, man. I mean, does it? Did you feel the pressure when you suddenly realize? Or not that you suddenly realize. You know who's playing, but they walk up to the center circle and say, like, "Time to decide how we get this done." The thing is, when you get those big games, CS, you don't just get them because you don't have a reputation. Mm. They're not going to throw an inexperienced referee on Mali versus Cote d'Ivoire when yeah. the Drogba is the captain of Cote d'Ivoire and Sadio Keita, who was then playing at Barcelona, is the captain of Mali. One of the greatest African players. There we go. Or you're not, you're not going to put a guy with little experience on Nigeria versus Egypt when you've yeah. got a young Mo Salah, El Neni, Victor Moses on Nigeria's side, and uh, some other players from Arsenal. Yeah. Uh, you know, <laughs> to su- name a few. superstars yeah. all on the same field. <laughs> so they're, they're not going to put... Anybody, that, so the players also know who the referees are. Yeah. There's also, the team study referees as well, and they know if it's a strong ref, they don't take any chances. So, but to get to, to get that chance, you've got to make bold decisions early in your career. So you build that reputation up that you're no nonsense. But you've also not got to be no nonsense. You've also got to be a manager of players yeah. as well. So you've got to have that balance. Got to have a balance between managing and having a relationship with players, and being that hard nut when you really need to be when the game's getting a bit spicy. Were you ever starstruck in your career? Sure. Uh, I mean, yes. it's perfectly natural yes. because you're a football fan at heart. Yes, I was. And then you're going like, oh, my God, Sadio Keita, for, for example. I mean, Barcelona, oh. 
I'm just using that. There's a many. So I was invited. So in 2012, at the opening of Wembley Stadium in London, there was England versus Brazil. England, Scotland, sorry. And what the FA did was because four of their English referees had done World Cup finals in different eras, so how we'll do it, 2020, Jack Taylor, 1984, whatever it was, so they invited four match officials to come and officiate that match. So Marcus Merck was the referee because he was from Germany. Jack Taylor did it in Germany. Then there was a South American referee, uh, Mia's fourth official, and then somebody else from another country where an English referee had done a World Cup final. And I just up with Beckham <laughs> <laughs> as the fourth. Okay. I don't know who came on for him. So there I'm holding the board, but I've got, he was my idol. Yeah. I never used to like him. Now I saw a documentary on him, not this new Netflix one, this is way before. And I just saw the media scrutiny and the, the paparazzi that follow him around. And I actually just, Admired the guy. Yeah. So now I'm holding out this board with number seven, red. Yeah. And might have been Gerard coming on, whatever. And he walked straight past me. Like, and I just looked at him like this. And I'm like, is that really him? <laughs> <laughs> but what a nice guy. We met him afterwards in the tunnel and such a nice guy. Um, probably the only time okay. I've been starstruck. Yeah. yeah. She's but a, a, Beckham was a such a legend star. in those uh, absolutely. days. Absolutely. I mean, he got over all those things where he was blamed for the 98 kick on Simone. Uh, he'd, he'd done the, that amazing goal against Greece to qualify for Euros. So he had got over all that. So he was more sort of content with himself. So he was more approachable. And what did you say to him? Or just, how's We're it? just talking about, because uh, I've got a funny thing when I go to the UK, I, I, I put on this accent. <laughs> <laughs> like I just to the I mean you are English by birth but my wife hates it <laughs> she says what are you speaking <laughs> oh, you whip out the Cockney accent <laughs> alright governor <laughs> well I was, in, I was in Newcastle twice and I was trying to get yeah. the Geordie one oh, right no, good luck with that one um, but uh, yeah I know it just comes out and he, like, got, he was just in passing I said good game David um, and he gave the ref his jersey I said nice touch to give the ref and he was just chatting and he said are you the one that subbed me off and <laughs> well, I've got the card from uh, <laughs> was it Ericsson then in those days from the coach. So, no, it was just a nice chat yeah. talking about England and football and, you know, just whatever motivation. I, I said, just keep up, keep it going, David. Yeah. And it was just so approachable. So that was nice that a superstar like that was willing to speak to a, a fourth official. No, no, I'm, I'm, who, but I'm just saying, fourth officials have even... I mean, who am I? Exactly. He doesn't like, know who I am. No one registers the yeah. fourth official. Yeah, really. so it was just nice <laughs> for him to go out of his way to have That's a, cool. a two-minute chat. Yeah, but the great ones often are yeah. that humble. Yeah. You know, and they... Yeah, it's very cool, man. Um, I've got to ask you, and it's the elephant in the room. You were so close to your World Cup mm. 2014. How difficult was that psychologically to deal with the fact that you were no longer... I mean, you had the kit. It, I'm sure the plane tickets were booked. It was. I was there. It, that's what I'm saying. You were there. I was in Brazil. <laughs> and it was done. So it was first day of training. And it was not even hectic training because in tournament time, you don't do high intensity because you're so busy either traveling sure. to your venue, doing a game. Then you've got uh, recovery yeah. training, maybe some speed work, and then your next game's coming. So there's no time for high intensity. The only guys that are getting high intensity are the guys that are having long breaks between games. So it wasn't even hectic. Then I just felt this win from So they divide you up into stations. So this group's doing this activity. So Because there's too many guys to all be in one session. Sure. So they divide you up. So I'm going for my third session, my last session, and I just went for a sprint, and I just felt this pain in my, um, in my calf. Oh, man. First day of training. Oh, my word. So I couldn't walk. I just stood still. And I've never had an injury so serious in my life. I've had a couple of hamstring strains, but this was an actual tear. And I, I just did not want, know what was going on with my body. It, you could actually hear it go. Oh, no. So I couldn't move. And first I, 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 day. First day of training. So the training coach is like, Bennett, move. Run, 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 run. I said, coach, I can't. I can't move. What's wrong with you? And they, were, they shout at you. And then they don't mess around because they, the ex expectation at FIFA is very high. That's a World Cup. So I couldn't move. So I got obviously two bo two blokes on the side of me take me off. Ice bag on. Next morning, straight to the hospital. Category category two uh, tear. 
oh, or word. almost separated from the from the tendon. Oh. So that was, yeah, my World Cup over because the diagnosis was it's going to take me four weeks just to recover, not even getting back into training. So the, the FIFA World Cup's obviously four weeks, so I sent home after 12. So they couldn't uh, <laughs> shift you into a fourth match official sort of thing? or I, could, I, was not, I was not able to. I couldn't even stand. Wow. That so the four weeks of the World Cup was just my rehabilitation, physio, treatment, no training. I would only be able to train after six. Oh, my word. So I was sent home. It must yeah, have been devastating. After, yeah, I was, I was broken. And if I'm honest with you and your listeners, I was drinking a bottle of whiskey a day. It went that bad. Wow. My family were like, we don't know who you are. Um, I was just going up to my, in my old place. I didn't even watch the World Cup. I could not watch a single game. I didn't watch a single game of the 2014 World Cup. And I, was, I became a loner. I went upstairs, I had a little loft room with a TV, and I just watched whatever was on telly with a bottle of whiskey next to the couch and just sleep there. I had to go, obviously, for my... So FIFA gave me money for rehabilitation, physio, um, and also gave extra money for psychological because they said, this is going to be a big blow to you. Yeah. When I first left Brazil, I'm like, so what had happened? When the, when the penny dropped, it hit me hard. It was very, very tough. When did that penny drop? When, when you were on the plane back? No, or? no, after a couple of days. And I, try, I, I went up and I did try to watch a football match yeah. in the World Cup and I just couldn't do it. And I thought to myself, I'm, I'm supposed to be there. Oh, I can't imagine your pain. Yeah, it's still, still, it's still tough. Uh, I, the world's biggest stage. And, you know, you've done all the preparation because you don't just go to the World Cup you need there's a process before so yep. they, they decide three years before a world cup who the panel is going to be and then you start your process so you go to all sorts of courses i think i went to six courses before the world cup in the three years in preparation so that the the preparation for a world cup is intense yes it's 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 hectic so you don't just go there a month before it's a three-year run-up before the world and cup you starts and your spot and i went through all those four three years of prep to come to the first day of training in brazil and done Oh man! Yeah, it was it was a hard pull to swallow, man. And and I imagine you needed a lot of love to get you through that Jeez. dark period, right? It was hard on my family as well because I just became a recluse. I just didn't care about anything. Obviously, I couldn't go training, and there's no release for me because my big release when I was when I get is just go for a run. Yeah, get it out, do a training session, do something, just get away from it all. Couldn't do that, so just started hitting the bottle. Wow, oh, man. Yeah, it was it was tense. And how did you overcome this? Because that uh, that you had to do some soul searching, I'm sure. To yeah, get I mean, that, I, eh? I I I I just got to a stage where I decided, what are you doing? You, you the PSL season's coming up. You got to prepare for that. You're not going to be fit. You're not going to be able to do anything in this state. So eventually, I went for, and this is not, the thing I'm not I'm not af afraid to say. I went for clinical psychology. Okay. Uh, look, FIFA gave me the money for that at 13 sessions at whatever cost it was. It was the best thing I ever did. Okay. And <laughs> if people think they don't need help, you do. Sometimes you need help, you go find it. And, you know, some people people are too proud nowadays to say, oh, I need help or I'm struggling, but deal with it because you are. Yeah, men I mean, the mental side mental of the side, game is it's 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 because of the highs and for and me, very it's low. more important than the physical. Okay. Um, Especially when it comes to the, the, the fitness test, especially that's a mental and a physical. You, you don't have to just be fit to pass the referee's fitness test. You have to be being mentally strong as well because it is grueling. Yeah. It's a grueling fitness test, and you really have to be on point. You can be as fit as you want, but if you're not psychologically strong in that fitness test, you're not going to make it. Yeah. And I think it's great what you say because there's no there's no shame in in looking mm. for people to talk to no. you know i think we should encourage it so if you are feeling down and you feel like you need to talk to someone please do there are people you can talk to and and daniel's yeah, yeah you advocate you know you're saying it changed a very dark time yeah. it, it, probably the lowest point of your career and was that you were back, able to bounce back yeah i mean it, it was putting pressure on my relationship with my wife mm. which as a result obviously rubs off on the kids. Yeah. So family life was appalling. It was, we were in a bad state. And I just decided I can't live like this. I'm not losing my kids and my wife. Just go sort yourself out. So. No, well done, man. Yeah.
that takes some, it's a brave move that to get and needed to be done, eh? Yeah. No, yeah. it did. I, I still think though, like it's not the defining part of your career though. Mm. I mean, seven hundred and sixty pro games. Yeah. My man, you're a legend. No, thank you. So you keep up that that amazing work and yeah, once again, just if you want to reach out to people to talk, please do. There's no shame in it all. We all need to talk to someone. So I think it's a, it's a it's an important part of, of sport and life. Yeah. Um, I want to move on to a few things. We've got a few minutes here, Daniel, and, and thanks for being so honest and open, man. But I remember a little while ago there was huge corruption with referees, the Lamptees, all that sort of thing. And I, I'm... I'm just kind of deciding whether or not I should ask you this, but I, I think I have to because it has been a huge focus point for the global media in African refereeing. And I know you mentioned a time when you were approached. I mean, do you think it's still happening in, in African football? Because, and I, I'm, I'm putting you on the spot, forgive me, but I think it's something we need to talk about because there have been huge steps to eradicate this and hats off to the authorities, everyone involved, but there's still bits and bobs happening, maybe not at the top, top levels anymore, but it's still happening. Well, I haven't been approached once. I've been approached many times. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> not once. The big one was times. in 2010 when I was offered from a betting company, first of all, 350,000 US dollars before I even left the country because the first leg was 5-1. Because of the odds on a 5 1 swing Cheaters, around, they yeah. wanted me to create five goals. 350,000 US. US. And then when I got to the country, another 350,000 US. So 700,000 US I could have made on one game. What's that? 50, is that 15 million Rand today? Yeah. yeah. Close to you. Yeah. So it was rife. Wow. I'm not involved with CAF anymore, so I wouldn't know. I mean, sure. you only know these things when you're in, 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 in sure. the actual battlefield. Sure. But um, I think what's going to prevent, and it's a good thing, uh, is VAR. Because okay. now you can't. Yeah. Because if you do make a mistake, in inverted commas, VAR is then to eradicate that mistake. So I think VAR is going to be a big prevention. Okay. But not every game has VAR. That's right. That's the problem. So at CAF, uh, AFCON, it's not going to happen. Yeah, because it's VAR. Because it's VAR. So plus a dodgy you got the, penalty. Plus you've got the whole committee there. Yeah, yeah. And you've got the refereeing instructors there. Because at the tournament, everybody's there. I mean, the committee... The physical instructors, the technical instructors, the whole committee, the chairman, the vice chairman. Um, so it won't happen at AFCON. But in Africa, on like the Champions League games, uh, I'm not sure if it's going on, but it, it was rough back in the day. Yeah, that's, I think maybe then VAR is the solution across the board. I know well, it costs money, but if you want a clean no, that's for sure. football, yeah. Same with doping, yeah. whatever it is, you've got to sort of spend the money to get that. Yeah, eradicated. if you want to clear an image, you've got to put your hand in your pocket, unfortunately. Yeah. I mean, 350,000 US. What did, how was your reaction? Obviously, you said no, but well, did you walk into a room and go, there's a cash a pile of cash on a table? Or? Well, the, f the first offer was from the betting company. Okay. And apparently, it was from Ghana because um, I did super sport and sundowns the wednesday before we left and god bless him thomas marichache came to me and they just played heart of oak the week before that in the uh other cafe the, the confed confed cup, cup yeah. yeah so he came to me immediately after the game <laughs> and i thought he was going to come because i think they lost and he was going to come and criticize and he said dan good luck there in uh tunisia <laughs> i said thanks man he says no not for the game because he was approached by a betting agent in Ghana wanting my number. Jeez. And obviously Thomas didn't give it. Yeah. And then Thomas said, they wanted to offer you 350,000 US to swing. <laughs> and then when we arrived in the country, it was literally cash. No. That's mad, eh? And my thing on that is it's karma. You take that money, what are you going to do with it? Yeah. You can't put it in the bank. No, in your S suitcase when you arrive. Or when... <laughs> Getting out, get out of that country won't be a problem. Getting in. What do you do then? Live a cash life. Yeah. <laughs> you go to a bank and exchange it to build a chance. So I was like, excuse me, uh, Mr. Bennett, there seems to be a lot more money in your and then, car. Yeah, you live a cash life. You go to a car dealership and you buy a car. You put your kids in your new car. Guess what? Karma. A truck hits that car, kills your kids. You live with that mistake. True. And that's my... That, uh, it's a highly improbable thing to have, but that's yeah. my attitude on it. Sure. It's like, what if it's not yours, don't take it. Yeah. I'm a big believer in if you deserve something, you get it. 
hard work pays off. There absolutely. And and kudos. I mean, no, I think you. other referees would have been quite tempted mm. to uh, live a cash life. Yeah. <laughs> Lastly, I've got to ask you, and, and it's um, a mate of mine played for a PSL club um, who I went to school with a couple of years back, and he says Muti is still a thing. <laughs> It's still a big thing. Uh, so, and we probably could do a whole podcast just on Muti, but have you had your run-ins with it? Or yeah, plenty of times. And I mean, was it at times where you're like, oh my goodness, what is going on here? Every Chiefs and Pirates dog, but there was Muti on the goalposts. And you, can you take it out? Or we tried to, but they won't allow you. And, and what course. did it look like? Or what was it so normally? Is it obviously, like? you've got to check the field. Yeah. So we get there an hour and Check the goalposts. Yeah, so yeah. we get to get there an hour and a half before the game. Chiefs Pirates, you always get there two hours because of parking congestion yeah, and the police are just all over the place and there's traffic. It's crazy. Um, so you obviously get there. As soon as you get there, you check the field. So then you can just focus on getting warmed up, getting the teams checked and whatever. So there was black stuff on the goalposts. On the goalposts? Yeah, they were painted on the goalposts. So when you try to come call the ground staff to clean it or the the, the maintenance, the groundsman, they point blank refuse. They won't even clean it. And then you try to walk because you've got to then go count the technical areas and try and see if there's any problems in there. They don't let you into those technical areas. But if Chiefs are playing Bloom Celtic or Pirates are playing Ajax Cape Town, you can walk into those technical areas and do what you want. But when it's Derby Day, it's not happening. That's amazing. It is. And so it, what do you do as a referee? You're an official well, of the match. They don't let us in. What can we do? I suppose. The match commissioner tries to negotiate. They do not let you in. They will not let you in. And they have the power. Oh, they've got big bodyguards. How <laughs> <laughs> are you going to get in past them? Oh, I see. <laughs> yeah. Literally stand on the technical area by the chairs. Yeah. Like just blocking off. Last one. What's the weirdest thing you've ever seen on a football pitch? Cheap as I've put Dan. Uh, Daniel's never coming back. You know that. <laughs> He's like, that CS guy, not a chance. Weirdest thing. I mean, I know like the Mooty stuff and you see the black stuff on the post, but there must be something that you were like, what is that? Or something that might have happened or anything like that. Gee. Because I know like the Mooty thing is a big thing, like bathing in the chicken blood before your first game and drinking the whatever special thing it is. But as a referee, were you ever at, at a point on your travels across Africa where you were like, that is bizarre? Or has it been plain sailing <laughs> this whole I time? I can't think of anything off the top of my head, CS. I'm, I'll be honest with you. No, it's no pressure. I, as yeah, I thought, no. maybe there was something that uh, sparked a memory or something. Yeah, if I can't like think of anything. Egypt is, or Ghana yeah. or... I mean, you've seen a few African countries in your time, right? Yeah, I think there's only three I haven't been to in our continent. And the most uh, intense atmosphere? Oh, Stadium? Algeria. Really? Yeah. Another level. Then it's not as intense as maybe Niger uh, Nigeria. Nigeria is just pure aggression. Yeah. It's just, and it's insane. The people go absolutely, they're football mad in Nigeria. And they do not want Nigeria to win on home soil. I once went to Nigeria and on the back of the newspaper was a picture of me saying, Super Eagles, beware. <laughs> and then they listed all the games that I refereed in Nigeria club and national team level and they're not won once. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they're playing Equatorial Guinea in the final group stage to qualify for AFCON. And they have to win against Equatorial And Guinea. there's Bennett rocking up at the ground. I'll find you the picture and I'll, you'll laugh. It, but it, that, that, was, that, was, that was tense. Because I'm the only white guy in Lagos. Yeah. <laughs> Travelling through Lagos Airport to go Hard to... to miss you. To go up to Abidjan, I think the game was played in. And it got Safa, Blazers written all over us. And we're all travelling in fours. So that was, that was intense. That was insane. But, uh, the, not, but the Algerians, it's just noise. Yeah, it's like being at an English Premier League match. They chant, they sing. Pretty much North, North Africa, Morocco do the same. Mm. Morocco is a very chilled, and Egypt they do chanting. It's like being in a in a European game. Man, that's crazy. Daniel Bennett, thank you for sharing your journey with us, man. Thanks and for having me. You can be proud on a on a stellar career, man. You really are a legend. And, thank you. Uh, keep up the good work. I know you're doing work with the Belgian league at the yeah. moment. So keep influencing and sharing that experience, man. It's, uh, it's invaluable, and I really appreciate your time. Thanks, Sios. Thanks for having me.
Cool. Thank you very much for watching. Remember to like and subscribe. We really appreciate your time. And big shout out to Betway. Check out betway.co.za for more as we continue to bring you more of the CS Duplicy show.